Well, I want to welcome everyone to the Hopkins demonstration forest. Uh, it's a beautiful, just a little bit afternoon here on Tuesday, um, beautiful day. And I'm standing right now in the middle uh, or edge of Little Buckner Creek. Uh, it's the creek that runs along the uh, border of our property. Um, kind of about the average flow this time of year. I'm not looking too, uh, too full or, or too small. So it's a pretty small creek. And uh, we're going to measure a few water quality um, factors that come into effect when we're talking about salmonoid uh, and some of the fish that might be in this stream. So some of those factors uh, or conditions are, we're going to look at is turbidity. We're going to be measuring pH, measuring temperature, and also the dissolved oxygen. Those four things uh, are really critical uh, to have be just in the right spot, uh, the right range, uh, if we're going to have a healthy stream for some of the fish. So we do know that there are fish in this stream. Uh, and maybe uh, another video down the road will come out and try to capture and uh, see what type of fish those are. But for today, we're going to be doing those four water quality parameters. So the first one that we're going to do is turbidity. And I'd like to start with turbidity because when I start getting in the stream, I, I can mess it up and muck it up just a little bit. Um, but turbidity, what is it? Well, first, it's a measure of how much suspended material, the small, small, fine particles that don't sink to the bottom of the water. They stay in that water as it moves down through the stream. So you have a couple of ways to do that. Uh, I'm going to show you some fancy stuff um, that we're not going to use today, but there's electronic devices. And these are you know, very accurate. This is a, a turbidity meter and um, kind of expensive, takes a lot of calibration and not a lot of abuse. A much better method, and it's something you can almost construct at home. If you look right down the tube, I don't know if I can get that in the camera, you'll notice there's a white and black disc in the bottom. That's called a secchi disc. Now, typically, we lower that into the water column like a lake on a rope with a, with a measuring tape attached to it. And when that depth of that disc gets so deep that you can't tell the difference between the white and dark part of the... Uh, circle, you measure that depth, and, and that kind of gives you the clarity. If any of you have been to a clear lake um, up in the Cascades, you can see all the way down to the bottom, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, Crater Lake, a good example. Uh, think of another maybe river during a heavy rainstorm, the Columbia. All those streams, everything pouring into it has a lot of sediment turbidity. So we're going to use this device, and it's pretty simple. What we do with it is we make sure it's clamped. Step upstream a little ways. And we fill that tube with water. Now, as just looking at that, you can see it, it, it's pretty clear. I, I grabbed a little, little fur needle. When I look down into that tube and I look really close, I can just barely see the difference between the light and black part. So the water here in Little Buckner Creek is so clear, it far exceeds uh, the height of this tube. So I could probably have another foot or so on top of this. This is in centimeters. So just kind of knowing what it looks like now, uh, the height of that water column would be about 80 centimeters. If you've been here to Hopkins before, you know we have a hand pump that pumps water out of the ground, perfectly safe to drink. When you pull it out of the water, or pull it out of the, out of the pump, uh, and look at the water, uh, actually the clarity of that well water is, is much less than uh, the stream here. So uh, the turbidity of our stream, I'd say very, very clear. And uh, so we, we're, we're a good check there. So the next thing I said I was gonna do was going to be pH. Now again, we've got a nice uh, electronic pH meter here, um, fairly accurate. Uh, problem is it takes a lot of calibration. You've got to make sure it's working properly and uh, it takes some maintenance. So again, electronics, they're, they're great. They give you some accuracy, but we're just going to measure with a, 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 a kind of a higher end uh, pH strip. Now what is pH? Well, it's, it's a scale. If you haven't heard of it before, between 0 and 14. We're in the middle, 
neutral is seven. As things get more acidic, um, like a lemon, sulfuric acid would be an extreme example, soda pop, carbonated water, it goes from seven down to zero. You have your vinegar down there. And then you go to the more base or alkaline, you go from, from seven to 14. Now pH, it's, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to explain, but the lower the pH, the higher level of hydrogen ions you have in it, and the higher the pH, uh, it's an OH negative, um, more content. Uh, that's not really the important part. Uh, the important part is waters in the forest, waters that fish like, uh, tend to be a little bit more on the acidic side of the scale. So they like them down a little above seven, uh, going down to about six. Amphibians like it a little more. And that's because when you get organic material in the water, that organic material, as it decomposes, as the parts of that uh, decomposition leach and go into the water, natural process, it, it kind of acidifies the water a bit. So we often want to see we have maybe a little on the, the between the six and seven side is perfect. Now with these pH strips, if you've ever used this kind of a, a piece of litmus paper, it's kind of a, a one shade. These are actually, they have four colors on them. And a little scale on, on the case. What I do with that is I, I kind of know this water is going to be probably between six or seven. Um, on the other side is more the alkaline. So I'm going to be on the acid side. Give that, dog, that uh, strip a quick uh, dip and then quickly look at it because the color will change. And I want to match where I think that lands. So after a couple seconds, I need to make sure I figure it out. And it's looking like it's, it's just about right. Uh, between six and a half. And if I do it too long, it'll get dark. So about six and a half. So water pH wise, slightly on the acidic side, so for our fish that we're talking about, uh, salmon, cutthroat, trout, um, that's perfect for them. So, so far, check on the turbidity, that looks good. Check on the pH, that looks good as well. And then the next thing we're going to do is a temperature. Now the temperature, you can use this device, it has a temperature gauge in it. It takes forever, it's a larger, uh, diode and the temperature. It's got a lot of plastics. When you stick it in, it has to cool down that tip. It's also expensive. What I like is a good old-fashioned uh, meat thermometer. Uh, we're going to go in Fahrenheit here. In Fahrenheit. And the nice thing, this is instant read and somewhat waterproof. So when I take and stick this in the water in about two seconds, I'll give it five, maybe three, uh, we'll have the temperature. So the temperature we're looking for uh, is definitely below 60 degrees. 65 is kind of pushing it Fahrenheit. And I'm right now uh, at 50, well now it's going right up, 54.5 is what the water temperature was. So just about right, about 65 is that threshold and Fahrenheit temperature. Salmon, that's kind of lethal at some point, if they stay in that for too long. Uh, get down to below 60, between 50 and 60, spot on. So, so far, Little Buckner Creek today, uh, I didn't plan this water, uh, it's doing pretty perfect, uh, temperature-wise, pH-wise, and um, turbidity. So, the last one is dissolved oxygen. Now, dissolved oxygen is, it's, it's not the bubbles you can see in the water, it's what the fish, when they take that, uh, and aquatic animals that have gills, when they take that water through their gills, that oxygen is absorbed and pulled out. It's not the little air bubbles that we might think that'd be perfect for us to, to breathe. So dissolved oxygen, we can't really see it, so we have to test for it. Again, a great electronic device, very accurate, but a really difficult one to maintain, and, and also, again, expensive. So I have a dissolved oxygen test kit that works really well, gives us a good range for fish, because a parts per million, um, it's not a huge range. So parts per million, you think about six parts per million, six parts oxygen to a million parts H2O. That's quite a bit. 
uh, of water to a little bit of oxygen. And fish have a six parts per million, at least the aquatic ones we're looking at today are looking out for, the salmonoids, the trout, the cutthroat that, are, that uh, I know are in this stream. Um, six is kind of their limit. Eight, if there's gonna be reproducing, uh, eight parts per million, that's kind of that limit there. And it goes on up to about 12 uh, is the ideal. Uh, of course, they can be in a little lower, a little higher, but if they're gonna be living in this habitat, their stream, they can't get out of it and take a break from over oxygen or hop out and take a breath of fresh air because they don't have any in the water. So this is a pretty simple test. And what it basically is, is a chemical reaction. I've got a little ampule here. It's got a tiny tip, a uh, capillary action. Uh, it's pre-filled with a small little bit of a chemical. And what I do is get a sample of the water. Then we'll go upstream a little bit. And I take that sample of water. This is kind of neat. Uh, capillary action at its best. I place the ampule into the uh, water, and I basically just give it a little break, snap the tip off, and magically it pulls that water into the uh, chemical, and there's a reaction. You'll notice it's turning blue. So that reaction is taking and reacting with the oxygen in the water. And then what we do, we have actually wait a little bit for that reaction to take place, but we'll just start it now. So we have over here a scale from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up into 12. Uh, and what we do is we slide that over until we match the color, kind of like doing the pH. So I have to tip it towards me. If you could be shouting out at me, telling me which way to go, it's a lot easier. Uh, but... Definitely not five. Again, we gotta, it takes a couple minutes for the full reaction to take place. Um, we are at six, seven. I'm gonna say if we stop here, um, and it might continue to go, we're at about seven. So seven. Yeah, now it's looking, now it's looking it's right about eight. So dissolved oxygen, we are on the lower level of the dissolved oxygen requirements for the, the salmonoid and the cutthroat trout we have here. But um, it does meet the minimum for their health, minimum health standard of six parts per million. Spawning quality, it's a little, a little on the low side, but right there at the bottom. So we have that potential in, in the stream, but um, Little Buckner Creek checked out pretty good today. And the only thing we really were missing, a little more dissolved oxygen, but we're at the minimum. The dissolved oxygen here, uh, how does it get into the water? And how can we improve that to make that habitat a little bit better? Well, it's doing its thing right now. Uh, the water moving and agitated, uh, kind of going through these little ripples and pools, kind of mixes some oxygen into it. You do get some uh, air and rainfall that kind of stimulates some oxygen input from the, uh, the uh, top of the water. Uh, vegetation growing, you'll notice that, that our stream is kind of small, so we don't have a lot of aquatic plants that can really feed into that oxygen pool. But one of the real big things, uh, our, our stream is very much groundwater fed. So if you know where Hopkins is at, here on Little Buckner Creek, we are almost at the top of the watershed. This creek flows down into the town of Malino, uh, or into Milk Creek, which runs by into Malino, which then runs into the Malala River, the Willamette, the Columbia. But if we were to keep walking up here, we'd eventually run out of stream uh, and not too far. So that groundwater comes in pretty low oxygen and it starts to get mixed in with the other water as this stream gets bigger and bigger. Um, but really, great quality, great condition. Uh, the next thing we'll look at uh, in another video, uh, hopefully later this week, um, is the food source. We got the water conditions required now we need to have food for those fish or aquatic animals uh, to eat. So we'll be looking at that uh, in a couple of days.